thank you all for being here, and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to today's event, Exceptions to the Rule, the Pol Politics of Filibuster Limitations in the U.S. Senate, hosted by Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Uh, with its eminent scholars and world-renowned library archive, the Hoover Institution seeks to improve the human condition by advancing ideas that promote economic opportunity and prosperity, while securing and safeguarding peace for America and all mankind. My name is Trevor Carlson, and I'm a manager of external affairs for the Hoover Institution. Many people believe that in today's partisan environment, the filibuster prevents the Senate from acting on all of the least controversial matters. But that knowledge is not exactly correct. Since the 1970s, the Senate has created a series of special rules, described as major majoritarian exceptions, that limit its debate on a wide range of measures. In her new book, Exceptions to the Rule, The Politics of Filibuster Limitations in the U.S. Senate, Molly Reynolds argues that these procedures represent a key instrument of majority party power in the U.S. Senate. So I'll now introduce today's panel. Uh, Molly Reynolds is a fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. She studies Congress with an emphasis on how congressional rules and procedures affect domestic policy outcomes. She also supervises vital statistics on Congress. Brookings is long running resource on the first branch of government. Reynolds earned her PhD in political science and public policy from the University of Michigan and her Bachelor of Arts in government from Smith College. Uh, Reynolds is being interviewed by Mike, Michael Frank, the Hoover Institution's Director of DC Programs, uh, where he oversees research and outreach initiatives. He also serves as a research fellow for the Hoover Institution. Prior to joining the Hoover Institution, Frank served as Policy Director and Counsel for House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and prior to that served as the Vice President of Government Relations for the Heritage Foundation for 15 years. With that, I'll turn it over to our panel. Thanks, Trevor. Welcome, everyone. Um, per Trevor's uh, description of what Hoover tries to do today, we're going to try to improve the human condition through having a detailed discussion of uh, Senate majoritarian rules and what they mean for the outcome of uh, important legislation. Um, as Trevor also indicated, I'm a House guy. I've had three different stints in the House. I don't pretend to understand anything about how the Senate operates, what motivates you guys. How many people here actually work in the Senate? Is it pretty much everyone? Good, good number. How many of you guys consider yourselves parliamentary nerds? Now you're, I, figured, I thought you were a nerd. Okay. So uh, what Molly has done, I think, is, is ser serving a great purpose here. She's gone through um, legislative history going back decades and decades, if not a couple of centuries, to understand um, how these super majoritarian traditions operate uh, and what they, what they have uh, wrought in terms of um, outcomes. So I'm going to turn it over to Molly to just give us the overview of you know, what, uh, when you got into this project and you started to evaluate, in some cases, trade issues, in other cases, health care, other cases, um, governance issues for the Senate and the House, and also um, things like energy policy and so on. Um, what did you find that maybe most surprised you about how these traditions apply in, in the real world when they hit the, when the rubber hits the proverbial road. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Mike, and I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the folks at Hoover for um, hosting us today. Um, so as, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so I started this project um, at this point more than five years ago, so I promise that when I um, decide what my next book is about, I'll tell all of you, because then you'll know that five years later it's going to be really <laughs> hot again. Um, I, did not, uh, I did not anticipate that when the book was finished that it would come out um, at a moment when <clears throat> the budget reconciliation process, which is what about half of the book is about, is going to be really, um, really timely. And so I think the biggest surprise for me when I started this project was, so I started it because I was interested in reconciliation. Um, I, this book began as my uh, doctoral dissertation in graduate school, and um, I started graduate school in the fall of 2009, so right in kind of the midst of when um, uh, congressional Democrats were debating whether or not to use the reconciliation process for healthcare um, in some way, shape, or form, which obviously they ultimately did in 2010. And, I, um, so I knew a little bit about reconciliation. What I didn't know is that reconciliation is but one of a broader class of procedures where um, the Senate has imposed uh, limitations on debate for particular bills. And so 
that was interesting to me was I considered myself someone who knew a fair amount about um, about Congress and the Senate, but this was a this was something that I didn't I didn't know really existed. So that's kind of why um, I dove into this project and. Um, the kind of big story that I tell in the book is that you know we think of the Senate as the super majoritarian place. We think of um, the filibuster, particularly in the contemporary Congress, as being what kind of rules the day, and the the need to invoke closure to get 60 votes um, really shapes the character and the pace and the tenor of the institution. But there are exceptions to that, um, and they they um, extend across a wide range of policy areas. So. Reconciliation is probably the best known one, but obviously the budget resolution itself um, also comes with a, a statutory limit on debate, meaning that it can't be filibustered. We saw earlier this year, um, uh, Mike mentioned a couple, we saw earlier this year um, another one, which is the Congressional Review Act, which mm -hmm. um, those resolutions also um, come to the floor under a statutory debate limit and thus, um, thus can't be filibustered. And so kind of the breadth of the, um, of the policy areas um, where these kinds of rules um, touch, I think, was probably the most surprising thing for me uh, mm -hmm. to discover as I as I dove into this. And maybe we can pull back <clears throat> for one second. And um, in your view, after you've gone through all this research, what what is the whole point of the Senate originally having pretty early in our republic adopted this tradition of supermajority consensus um, building? Why did it happen? Has it outlived its usefulness? Um, you said it shaped the character of the Senate. Anyone who worked in the House certainly can appreciate how different the Senate is from the House, for example, and that there's always been this, um, I've noticed, in it's like, almost like a conversation stopper when you have one of these procedural discussions and anyone in the House is trying to lighten the whole supermajority load a little bit to make things happen. Oh, but you just want to turn the Senate into, an, into the House. And that's, okay, that's the end of the conversation, right? Uh, what is the point, you think, big picture of doing this in the first place for the audience? So um, I think one kind of myth of the filibuster is that it was um, some sort of like purposeful decision by, uh, by the Senate. This has gotten more fun to talk about in the post-Hamilton era because now everyone is really interested in Aaron Burr. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the principal reasons why uh, the filibuster exists is because in the early uh, 19th century, uh, Aaron Burr, who was the, um, at that time the vice president, was sort of surveying the Senate's rule book and found that there were uh, some motions in there that he thought were duplicative. The early Senate wasn't making use of its previous question motion, um, which would allow it to cut off debate with a majority vote. Um, it was using uh, the motion to postpone more than it was using uh, the previous question. So Aaron Burr said, eh, we don't really need both of these motions in the rule book. Um, and so uh, as part of a part of a revision, uh, that was removed. And that helped set up um, the, uh, the, tr the tradition of unlimited debate in the Senate. It's not the only thing. Um, the right of recognition, the fact that the presiding officer um, has to re uh, recognize senators who are um, looking to speak. But we, uh, I mean, we got until the beginning of the 20th century without a cloture motion at all, without the rules prescribing for a way to end debate with a supermajority of senators. And then over the course of the 20th century, what that threshold, that supermajority threshold has been to invoke cloture has varied. And so the idea that we have kind of um, an evolution in the Senate's rules in this way um, is, I think, important to remember. Um, one of the big stories that I try to tell in the book is that in kind of the modern Congress, um, most of the uh, work in the book looks at um, period from about 1970 to the present, is that the Senate's majority party periodically looks at um, particular policy issues that it needs or wants to be active on and decides that creating these special procedures um, will help it achieve a certain policy objective. Uh, and often it actually needs to get members of the minority party to cooperate uh, with it to, um, to pass the law that creates the special, uh, the special procedures. But it isn't, um, it's not, it's not sort of, I don't see it as kind of a principled um, fight over the evolution of the Senate. Um, it's, 
from, from my mind and what I try to argue in the book is a lot of it is about these policy choices and when, uh, when does uh, the Senate's majority party think that they can get something done uh, by creating special procedures that help them do it. Mm -hmm. One thing I was thinking about as I was reading through the book too is the, um, <clears throat> there was an op-ed a year ago or so, I think it was Senator Sass, and he made the point that I guess the three largest, the three most significant bursts of uh, actual successful government um, activity occurred in the 30s, the New Deal in the 65, 66 Congress, the Great Society Congress, and then in 09 and 010. Uh, in each instance, you had that rare moment where you had a president of a party majority in the House of that same party and a supermajority at that point in the Senate, uh, at least for some portion of that. <clears throat> and that absent that, that alignment of the planets, it's really, really hard to get big things done. So in a sense, is, is that part of what's going on is that the, the efforts to, to r relax the supermajority standard um, is, frustrate, is out of frustration, is, is just designed to actually accomplish a particular goal. And I think you, you go through a lot of instances in your book where you discuss the, uh, uh, the time frame between a, um, a supermajority provision in a statute and then when policy debates relating to that occur yep. and whether they were successful or not. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I do think, um, <clears throat> I think this idea of the, the two sides um, being frustrated with one another um, is an important dynamic in kind of the overall evolution of um, both the, uh, the Senate's procedures and importantly, how they're used. I mean, one of the things that I, that I talk about in the book is that you know, we can have these, uh, these procedures on the books and you're right that I, um, I do the best that I can uh, to document kind of once a procedure is created, how soon after that does it become relevant? And the answer is usually quite quickly. So um, mm -hmm. I think there's, some, there's a pretty good sense that when the Senate is thinking about how to uh, when to make these, uh, to put these special procedures uh, in law, they're anticipating a situation that's going to come up on the agenda imminently. So I would, you know, as one recent example of that, there are, um, there are the provisions that were included in the legislation allowing congressional review of the Iran deal that um, provide for expedited consideration of snapback sanctions um, as, as um, they've been they've been called, and so that was clearly an issue where Congress anticipated that in the near term, it might need to, uh, uh, this might be a policy area that came back on its agenda, and it, it could benefit potentially from having some special procedures to consider um, <coughs> that legislation. But more broadly, I would say that um, the idea that uh, one side observes um, the procedures being used in a particular way uh, and then becomes frustrated and chooses to take a procedural step in retaliation, I think is, a, is an overall dynamic that characterizes a lot of how, um, of how we see Senate rules um, and procedures being used over time. And by quick, you mean within one year of enactment? So of oftentimes it's that quick, um, <clears throat> sometimes it's not quite that quick. Um, and part of why this is kind of hard to get at is because, you know, the procedures could be relevant without them ever actually being used. I mean, if we're, if we're talking about these procedures, and I'm sure we're gonna get uh, it more into reconciliation um, as, as our conversation goes on, but you know, one of the biggest ways in which the Byrd rule is relevant is that it sort of shapes the deals that folks make off the floor before we ever see Byrd rule challenges on the floor. And the same is kind of true of most, um, I think, procedural innovations in the Senate. That, the, uh, the issue can be relevant without, without us ever actually seeing the rules um, and procedures used. Um, but yeah, I would say um, in general, um, it's, it's quite quick. Sometimes as soon as a year, mm -hmm. sometimes um, within a couple of years. The issue that the, the special procedures um, are meant to deal with comes back up mm -hmm. on, uh, on the Congress's agenda. Okay, so you opened that can of worms. You mentioned reconciliation. I know that's why you're all here. <laughs> Let's talk about reconciliation. Big picture. What did you come away with um, as a takeaway in terms of the, the supermajority requirement, the, the insulation from that in the reconciliation process, and what that's meant for public policy? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a chapter in the book where I tried to really dig into this question of, okay, so we have the reconciliation procedures. 
They um, obviously allow certain bills to move through the Senate without the possibility of a filibuster. They're not unlimited. Uh, but what do they actually mean for, for policy? And so there's a chapter in the book where I look at kind of the spending side of, um, of reconciliation. Um, and I argue that when the Senate is writing a reconciliation bill, um, it often does so with an eye towards what are the electoral needs of the Senate's majority party in the next election? And where uh, does it make sense? What programs does it make sense to change um, with an eye towards the electoral needs of the particular senators in um, the Senate's majority party who are going to be up for re-election in the next cycle? Um, and I, I document how um, those needs shape the way that the, um, the sort of substance of the reconciliation bill. I will say that one kind of lesson that I've taken away from this year's experience with reconciliation so far is that sometimes those individual needs and the individual interests of the senators in the Senate majority party uh, can come into conflict with kind of the collective needs of the party as a whole. Because winning elections isn't just, it's both about kind of the party's overall reputation and particularly in the Senate, it's about where are the specific seats that you need to defend in the next election. And sometimes those things can come into conflict with one another. And I think for me, a big part of the story of what happened with the effort to use reconciliation on healthcare this year was that the need, <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, the goal of getting something that met the party's overall objective of um, repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act was in conflict with the particular interests of individual senators. Mm -hmm. um, also, when you, when you look at reconciliation, <clears throat> what are the, I think you'll go through some examples of what specific legislative uh, achievements were, were to be had because of that mm -hmm. lower threshold. And what, did, what does that, if any lesson, uh, does that convey with respect to the overall idea of you what know, some people, especially in the House, want, yeah. right, turn the Senate into a, a smaller version of the House? Right. So I'll say two things. I'm, I would like to come back to this idea that if we just expanded the kinds of procedures that I talk about in the book, we'd end up with a Senate that's the same as the House, because I don't actually think that's true. No, let's hear that. That's a good. But I'll come back to that in a second. Yeah. Um, but in terms of kind of the policy changes that we've seen achieved using the reconciliation process, um, I think obviously we've paid a lot of attention over the past year to the parts of the Affordable Care Act that were done <coughs> that way. But there's a going back to the early 80s, um, there's a there's a long record of changes on both the tax side and the spending side. Um, the 1996 welfare reform bill was a reconciliation bill. Um, the, uh, the Bush tax cuts were done through reconciliation. And one thing that's I think worth noting is that we've seen reconciliation bills passed in the Senate with fewer than 60 votes, but we've also seen a number of them passed with more than 60 votes, um, which I think um, complicates the story a little bit, but it's not, um, in a lot of ways, it's about achieving the partisan goals of the majority party, but there are also, I think, important examples of bipartisan bills that were, that were done through the process. Um, so to come back to your point mm -hmm. about would we end up, if, if we <coughs> sort of took what I talk about in the book to its logical conclusion, we end up with the Senate looking exactly like the House, and I don't think so. And I think it's in large part because um, the Senate's electoral incentives are just fundamentally different than those of the House. So senators both serve longer terms, they serve um, a much broader constituency, and because of the staggered um, nature of Senate elections, what it means for a Senate majority party to need to build a record that it can run on in the next election looks um, can look quite different from um, cycle to cycle. So, mm -hmm. you know, you compare kind of what's happening right now in advance of the 2018 elections, where there are many more seats held by uh, Democrats that are up, versus what was happening in advance of the 2016 elections, when there were many more seats held by Republicans. Um, and so, I think that those dynamics mean that. Um, uh, I mean, that the, the Senate's character is really different, um, even absent uh, 
the rules. And I actually think if we kind of want to dig into a particular particular example from uh, the tax debate, I think the debate over this, what to do about the SALT deduction is a really good example of this. So mm -hmm. in the House, when um, the House has been working on its version of the tax legislation, part of um, why, it, uh, why the, the, the issue of the state and local tax deduction was really, um, a really thorny one is because there are a group of House Republicans who are from districts, <laughs> sort of s much smaller geographic areas where that's a, a, a big deal and for whom uh, in many of those districts, uh, those members um, have reason to think that they might be electoral, electorally vulnerable. Um, a lot of those uh, members from districts where uh, there are a lot of uh, people who take the SALT uh, deduction, those districts are won by Hillary Clinton. So that's sort of a, a different political reality than in the Senate where most Senate Republicans are from states where sort of across the whole state, um, the SALT deduction is less, less of an issue. And so that, I think, is an illustration of how the different electoral incentives of the two chambers as a res that result from the different institutional arrangements have, have different policy implications. Another area, <clears throat> maybe we can talk about this in the context of, uh, let's say, seepage in, into the, le the legislative realm of the changes with respect to nominations. Mm -hmm. Two stages, you know, first in 2000, but 13, um, with lower court judge, lower level judges and, and nominations in general, and then more recently with Supreme Court. Is that, A, what does that mean, big picture to you, relative to your research? And second, um, is that any kind of a marker for a, a continuation along that path where it would seep into more generally to lowering it overall on legislative calendars? As well? Yeah, so I see um, the, what's happened with nominations in kind of a broader context that I was, um, I alluded to earlier with the idea that over time we've seen kind of a, um, a tit for tat retaliatory um, move on from members of both parties in the Senate um, where one party will do something procedurally um, and then that will, as a, often out of sort of real frustration at the other side from stopping them from doing something, I think this is what happened when uh, Democrats chose to use the so-called nuclear option in 2013, and then the other side, particularly if they have subsequently gotten back into the majority, will choose to uh, to retaliate. And this sort of slow-moving ratcheting up of the procedural stakes, I think, describes a lot of what we've seen over time, both in terms of procedural change in the Senate, but also the use of the existing procedures. And so I, I mentioned this a little bit before, which is that we can have procedures um, that are on the books and that are available, but it, we don't always see them used. And so the, the choices about how to use them, I think, are often as important as the choices about kind of when to change them. Um, in terms of what do I see over, uh, whether I think that the changes on the nomination side kind of foreshadow a change um, more broadly, I'm skeptical, I think, that we will see a sort of whole scale um, abolition of the filibuster in the Senate anytime soon um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the existence of the filibuster is a big part of what gives individual senators um, their power, and I think that and this is one of the things that I try to argue in the book, is that in order to get any kind of procedural change, you have to convince individual members that it's in their interest. And I, I'm just not sure that we're, um, that we're there yet um, with, um, with the, Senate, um, the, the Senate filibuster. When they um, <clears throat> make that evaluation as to whether or not it's in their own interest, can you offer any um, uh, enlightenment as to whether that evaluation is done along partisan lines or regional lines or in some other way. It strikes me that a lot of times there's some situational ethics going on relative to who's in the majority or minority, and you, you get less of these cross the aisle alliances that might be a function of rural state versus some other kind of a category of state. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth, I think part of that is because um, in kind of the broader political system, we've seen over time um, a much uh, 
sort of clearer sorting of um, the parties mm -hmm. into. So on, there are certainly still <coughs> some issues on which there are important um, regional alliances that transcend um, party. But I think as we've seen um, the uh, parties become increasingly geographically concentrated in particular areas, there's mm -hmm. much less of a um, of a possibility for those kinds of um, alliances. I mean, when I say that I think that senators evaluate their individual needs, it can be on any number of uh, dimensions. I tend not, I tend to think it's not largely on kind of a principled dimension. I don't, I think that when we think about questions of procedure, we're really thinking about questions of power and who has power and who doesn't, and how do you use that power to get things done. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in the contemporary Congress, it's often largely on partisan lines, but historically um, that's not necessarily been true. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. been uh, along other dimensions as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think maybe at this point, let's open it up to your questions, because I'm sure you have a lot. And we have one right there in the front row, and please be, identify yourself perhaps and just sure. don't give a speech, that's all. All right. Uh, I'm Richard Skinner. Yeah, so if, I don't know if everyone can hear the question, but Richard asked about the decision to use the reconciliation process in 1981 um, to, uh, uh, to move some pretty significant legislation in uh, the first year of Reagan's term in office. Um, and that um, marks, I think, the, the first use of the process that looks more like the way that we've come to understand it. Um, uh, contemporaneously, um, what I would what I would say in terms of um, why that was particularly important and like what motivated them to do that is there was a um, a real desire um, to and I talk about this a little bit in um, in the book there was a real desire to minimize the number of um, votes that they needed to take on the package they were really worried about the idea of um, the package getting um, unwound. So it's gonna be this kind of carefully log rolled, um, composed piece of legislation. And they wanted, um, they wanted to get it through in as few votes as possible. And so they kind of contemplated a number of different um, procedural avenues and they saw reconciliation um, as a particularly easy, or a, probably, um, they decided that uh, the reconciliation process was the best strategy that they had available to them to kind of get this negotiation together and get it through um, with um, with as few votes as possible. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes, sir. Sam Ambrose, Senator Timmy's office. Uh, historically, did you see any major uh, trend shifts uh, post the 17th Amendment? How, how the Senate Yeah, so most of what I take up, in the, it's a great question, most of what I take up in the book is um, much later in the 20th century. Um, and so uh, the 17th Amendment is obviously an important um, change in um, the Senate's history. Um, and there is, um, there's some other, um, you know, great political scientists political science by people who aren't me that tries to get at, you know, what did the 17th Amendment mean for, say, senators' electoral incentives? Did it, did um, the shift to popular election change what, uh, uh, what, that, what that meant? Um, and I think there's some evidence that it did, that they started feeling that they had to be more responsive to voters than to, uh, uh, than to once they were elected, um, elected directly. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's a, it's a, um, a to think about kind of the what it meant uh, procedurally is not something I've done, but it's a it's a great question, something worth thinking about. In um, <coughs> those senators in recent times who were appointed to fill vacancies because of the Seventh Amendment, do you see how they approached the filibuster? Whether like they, they initially came in and hated it? Yeah, it's a it's a, that's a great question um, that I haven't really thought about before. Um, that would be really interesting to look at, and I will say that I. Th that um, one thing that I think we've seen um, recently in the Senate is um, 
some degree of kind of generational uh, attitudes, maybe it's the best way to put it, about um, towards the filibuster from senators who come into the chamber and all that they know is uh, the, the idea that everything needs 60, that everything we do is structured around the need to get 60, the, like the, the pace of the chamber and um, all that kind of stuff is, is shaped by that. And so I think that to the extent that we've seen um, some agitation from both sides of the aisle about doing something about the filibuster, a lot of times it's come from, um, I don't want to say younger, because not necessarily, <laughs> but from newer, um, newer senators. Um, and that that, I think the idea that there's some kind of a, a cohort effect, that kind of when you come into the chamber and the types of members you come into the chamber with, mm -hmm. um, shape your attitudes somewhat on uh, procedures. I think there's something there. I think a lot of it is also sort of this idea of just what do you want to, what does your party want to do and how do the, how do the procedures um, help or hurt your ability to do that. But I do think we've seen some pretty good, um, pretty good evidence that, um, that newer members are maybe starting to have kind of different attitudes than people who've been around for a long time. Along the same lines, <clears throat> more of a follow-up to that, what about um, senators who had come to the Senate from the House? Uh, my recollection is about ten, eight, ten years ago, some made the point that I think there were 53 senators who had served in the House, and that that was at a time when there was all this agitation about nuclear options and so on, and the attribution was, well, they just want, again, they want to take what they got used to in terms of the pace and the level of um, successful outcomes for some piece of legislation and, and, and use, use a change in the rules to um, alleviate the frustration they were feeling as newly minted senators who couldn't get anything done. Right, right. Is that a? Yeah, so I don't, um, I don't have, um, I don't sort of look at that specific question in the book, but I, again, I think there's probably something to that. Um, there's, some, um, there's some other work in political science that suggests that um, particularly for um, senators who first served in the House um, and came in around kind of 1994 and were socialized into their House service by Speaker Gingrich, that that kind of had mm -hmm. a lasting effect on how they approached being legislators. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think your point um, is sort of, um, is consistent with that. Um, and just the, uh, the, the broader idea that um, how you um, how you learn to be a legislator um, mm -hmm. that broader context matters for kind of how you approach the task. Well, we have a topic for your next book. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, five years hence. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike Stern, I'm a former Senate and House staffer. Um, so my question is, uh, how if you have any insight on how senators justify in their own mind when the rule that's in the Senate doesn't make that distinction. And how, how do they, or do they, or do they have any explanation in terms of what the rules require as to why they have changed it for nominations versus legislation? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is I can't read senators' minds. I wish that I could. It would make me way better at my job and probably mean I should have a different job. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, one argument that I've often heard made is that um, the, uh, the Senate's role in um, the uh, presidential appointment process is different in character than its um, role as a legislative body. Um, and so that distinction may be important. Um, I think from a political perspective, um, and again, I tend to think about most of the decisions that senators make about procedure as being politically motivated, um, kind of where political is a pretty expansive term here and not based on principle, um, that the, the changes that we've seen around the uh, procedures for nominations really for me, are, uh, were largely politically motivated. So in 2013, Democrats had gotten sufficiently frustrated about uh, what was happening that they didn't see any other way to get uh, 
President Obama's nominees confirmed than changing the rules, and they were willing to make that change because they thought it was in kind of the interest of a sufficient number of individual senators and the collective interests of the party. And then this year we saw the same thing happen on the Republican side, in part because Democrats had sort of taken the, the step to ratchet it up a little bit. So that's, I, that's what I would say. Any more questions? Come on. How many nerds here have more questions? Or non-nerd questions? Yes, ma'am. So I think that, um, so are you asking that if we sort of abolished the filibuster, um, would we just get sort of more partisan legislating and thus less of a, a need to compromise across the aisle? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, th I mean, I think that that's um, true in a lot of cases. So I think that if we, uh, if we didn't need to get to 60, that we would obviously see more done um, that didn't um, uh, that didn't need uh, bipartisan cooperation. I mean, but I would also point out, as I did earlier, that in the history of the use of reconciliation, we have seen a number of reconciliation bills passed on a bipartisan basis, and um, those were often. Um, under uh, divided government. So, you know, if we think about, say, the Clinton welfare reform bill, which had a Democrat in the White House, but Republicans controlling um, both chambers of Congress, that passed with a, a large uh, bipartisan majority in the Senate. Um, and so that's kind of the, that's the, the broader uh, uh, institutional arrangement of partisanship, I think, mattered there. So I do think we would see, I mean, I, and I think we've seen this in the case of nominations. Like I think we've seen some um, nominees get confirmed um, in the in the absence of um, supermajority closure for nominations that we wouldn't have seen get confirmed um, otherwise. So I, I do think that that um, I think that would uh, that would happen on legislation as well. But I also think that uh, it's probably it's it's worth kind of taking a step back and and thinking about the broader context and what is it. And as we sort of saw with the healthcare bill this year, like the ability to legislate on a party line basis doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna get what you want if you can't get a simple majority within one party to agree. How much of that, that question relates to the, <clears throat> the way in which the parties have really almost perfectly sorted themselves by ideology in recent Congresses. I mean, I think that's certainly a big part of it, um, and the the idea that you know there's there's no over there's there's no ideological um, or very little ideological overlap between mm -hmm. um, between the parties, and that especially on the issues that the majority party chooses, or at least has chosen so far this year to put on the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could imagine some issues on the agenda on which there would have been more um, uh, partisan overlap, something mm -hmm. like, say, infrastructure. infrastructure but yeah. that's, not, that's not what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I definitely think for those issues on which the parties are really um, really quite sorted, uh, we'd, see, uh, we'd see less compromise. But again, it would only matter if a simple majority of senators actually agreed um, on what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have a little more time. Yes, sir. Well, let me follow up on yeah. that last question. So if, if there weren't an option of a uh, simple majority vote for these big policy things like health care reform, how would that affect the, I mean, would that cause, would that cause the initial strategy 
we can do on a basis where we can get 60 votes. Would that, would that completely change issue selection, if you will? Um, yeah, so I think, and this is something that I don't really talk about in the book, but I've started to think about more since the book came out, is kind of the interaction between um, the procedures and the ones that we have and the ones that maybe we could adopt and this issue of agenda selection in <coughs> the Senate. Um, and is there, there, there are certain issues that are more amenable to party line legislating through the reconciliation process um, because of the constraints that the, the Byrd rule uh, puts on the process than others. Um, and so if what you're trying to do is uh, particularly under, say, unified party control, like what we have right now, if you're trying to um, fulfill voters' expectations that under unified party control, you know, Republicans should be able to deliver on their campaign promises because they control the House, the Senate, and the presidency, that may lead you to make a certain set of agenda choices that would be different if you didn't have the ability to, to move um, certain things on a party line basis. Okay, any final question? Okay, well again, thank you so much for coming and please join me in a warm round of applause for Molly.